Hello everyone and welcome back to Progress America Unfiltered. It's me, Tyler, and I'm here today with Rhett and Linda to actually do a little bit of a deep dive into the Senate. So we've got two Senate related topics we want to talk about. The first is um, notorious Arizona Senator Kristen Sinema, and then we're going to talk about a little bit about the Senate as a whole, their makeup, uh, and the age demographics that we see among these people who we have elected to represent us. So without further ado, Rhett, I know that you know a ton about Kristen Cinema, and I don't, so I really need you to spell out for me what's going on with her. Why are we still mad at her? I'm happy to join on. Just let me know what to think. Yeah, for sure, Tyler. So um, viewers at home, you may remember Senator Kirsten Cinema from Arizona from uh, her past few years in the Senate between wearing purple wigs, be, being the first bisexual senator, openly bisexual senator, to be sworn into the Senate by none other than Mike Pence. Um, we saw that kind of in the beginning of her career. Looking way back before she was a senator, we saw a very progressive Kirsten Cinema, But now we are seeing a Kirsten Cinema that has sold out her Arizona constituents, sold out the progressive values that they elected her to uphold in the Senate when they flipped the seat. And Senator Cinema has, of course, changed her political party to independent. And so the Change for Arizona PAC recently filed a complaint alleging that Kirsten Cinema has um, spent $180,000 of campaign finances, um, questioning the legitimacy of them, using those finances for things like uh, lavish resorts, hotels, chauffeurs, you name it. And like, she would put it like as, you know, like a fundraiser or something, and then like go like hop on a jet to Paris and like where is the fundraiser? We don't know. Um, definitely do some more of your own reading into this topic, everybody at home, because it really is a wild one. We'll put some links into the description. But like basically, um, another thing that Senator Cinema really likes to do is she likes to like run marathons and she likes to train like a really intense athlete. And so like many people in DC like see her like running through like the reflecting pond, running through the memorial, all of that good stuff. Um, of course, but like, you know, when is she taking the meetings with her constituents? When is she doing town halls with her constituents? These are the things that people just do not have the answers to. And so, you know, when we're talking about change for Arizona, electing a Democrat to the Senate, because that is what Arizonans tried to do when they elect her, right? They put all this effort into electing her and then she just like flipped out on them and became an independent centrist, all of that good stuff. That's not so good. Kind of scary. Um yeah, it's just like she really sold them all out. And now this complaint alleging $180,000 of campaign finances that were spent poorly, I think is going to illuminate a lot of problems for her, but also for other members of the Senate too, right? Because it's like, you know, we want people to be held accountable. We want these senators to be held to account when they, mis uh, when they misspend their campaign finances. And so Senator Cinema is like a very... A uh, visceral example of what that looks like to like let the gluttony of public office kind of fall to the wayside of uh, doing the job of the constituents. But, you know, we really want to make sure that we're holding her to account. So it's going to be fascinating to see how this kind of plays out. Tyler, what do you think about this? You know, I think it's really interesting. I think this news is coming at a time where we're really examining and having a lot of scrutiny around public finance, campaign finance, and what people at the highest levels of our government are doing with money that they, that they get and where they're getting this money. So an obvious example of this is George Santos, who was just indicted for misappropriating campaign funds, um, alleged like unemployment fraud, things like that, um, and getting money that is not being used for what he's saying it's being used or getting money that he should not have gotten in the first place. So that's one. Um, and that's on the House side. But then we've also got people like Clarence Thomas, who's not an elected representative, who's an appointed person on the highest court in the land, who, you know, had decades of uh, lavish trips from Nazi co memorabilia collecting billionaire uh, Harlan Crow, and seeing the ways that um, I would say our elected officials have not adequately been holding him accountable, accountable as of yet. Um, so I think it's a really interesting time for all of this to be coming out about cinema, but I also think there's something fortuitous in this because I think people are paying attention and are really starting to be more tuned into this issue of the fact that so many people in these high offices are acting unethically 
while also understanding that cinema was elected by the people and is up for re-election coming up and is running as an independent slash spoiler. So we have a real chance, especially Arizona voters, to stand up to this behavior and kick her to the curb. But before I go any further on that, Linda, uh, do you have any thoughts on that? Yeah, so this really just makes me think about the outsized attention and power that cinema gets. You know, I would say George Santos, too. And a lot of that is because we have such a closely divided uh, Congress due to a lot of gerrymandering and other undemocratic features of our institutions. So that, you know, I would say that the majority of members of Congress, especially on the Democratic side, are there for the right reasons. And so, you know, I don't want like people, you know, maybe young people or others who are just learning about politics for the first time to hear about people like Cinema and Santos and just become really cynical and think like, oh, all politicians do that. And in fact, that attitude is even part of what gave us Donald Trump, that a lot of people felt like, sure, he's a crook, but all politicians are crooks, and at least he's going to be our crook, right? And, you know, that's really not true. A lot of people are in Congress for the right reasons, are actually interested in doing their job and not just grifting and stealing. Um, and, you know, I think that that's important to keep in mind. And it's really great that the people of Arizona have a chance to um, get rid of cinema and to elect someone who actually is going to care about representing them. Exactly. And Tyler, I want to go back to one note you had about Harlan Crow, uh, the billionaire that usually refunds Republicans that gave money to Clarence Thomas, of course, uh, through the form of vacations, etc. cetera. Uh, Harlan Crow actually gave money to Cinema's campaign and uh, Joe Manchin's campaign as well. So we'll link that in the show notes below in the description. That's just another like, thing I wanted to plug there, like how connected these different kind of avenues are of like disruption, disrupting the democratic process, which is like the small D democratic, but also the big D democratic, like harming the democratic party. Um, which of course that people elected these senators to be Democrats, but then they're falling to kind of the billionaire interests, of course, just that looks a little too appealing that they want to just fall into those billionaire interests. You know, you got elected yeah. to the Senate. Hey, but if I can get a ski trip, maybe they are just, are, no. they think that's too appealing or something. Who knows? I'm so glad you bring that up, Brett. That is so important to talk about. And it kind of brings me something to, I wanted to circle back towards like in the beginning, you listed all of these, you know, kind of, I guess we can say historic things about cinema that, you know, she was the first openly bisexual person represented, uh, uh, sworn into the Senate and all of these things. She had the colorful hair, the outfits, whatever. But I think it reminds me of a saying from Charleston, where I'm from, you know, all skin folk ain't kin folk. And just because there's somebody whose identity, you know, we talk about identity politics all the time, just because there's somebody who you might share an identity with does not mean that you are aligned with that person. And I think this is such an important example of that. For all intents and purposes, so many people, so many women, so many people in the LGBTQ community like cheer to have someone like cinema elected. And we see how quickly not only does power corrupt, but how just because someone claims to be a part of your community does not mean that you are in community with them. And that is really, or they don't think that they are in community with you. And so I think that we are seeing the Santoses of the world, the cinemas of the world, the Clarence Thomases of the world. They are not in community with you, similar to what you were saying, Linda. They are not doing the corruption for you. They are only ever doing it for themselves. And that's my biggest takeaway from all of this. Yeah, I think that's a great point, Tyler. I could ramble on and on about cinema all day, but I want to talk about the Senate at large. So something that we've been discussing a lot internally here at Progress America Unfiltered are the demographics of the current Senate. And I want to bring up something that one of our producers um, brought up when we were talking about this show and planning for this show. Um, so our producer, Michael, brought up the fact that there are the same number of senators over 80 right now as there are 45 and under. I'm going to say that again. Right now in our Senate, we have the same number of senators who are over the age of 80 or the age of 80 and over as we have senators who are 45 and younger. That is a huge, huge disparity that is not necessarily reflective of this country. So um, I want to start with you, Linda. Can you just tell me what your thoughts are about specifically the age discrepancies that we've been seeing in the Senate? And I know we want to talk about the big one, Diane Fe Feinstein. Yes, yeah, so this issue, it's really been at the forefront lately because of Dianne Feinstein, who's 89 years old, um, and she was gone from the Senate for quite a long time with shingles, which was holding up votes on the 
Judiciary Committee that she serves on, and then she's now returned, and it seems like based on her conversations with reporters, she's not even aware that she was ever gone. And yet certain people, including some of her colleagues, um, I believe including Nancy Pelosi, are saying that telling Feinsteins that she, that she should step down is age discrimination and sexism. And like that's hard to hear because it does feel like weaponizing a real issue. Like it is true that age discrimination is a real problem, especially for women, um, and that women can face it as early as their 40s or 50s, and that we shouldn't be pushing people out of the workplace or marginalizing them just because they've gotten a little bit older. Um, but at the same time, like ability to do your job, especially when you're a U.S. senator, is really important, and that senators do serve for six your terms. And so like, I don't think that there should necessarily be an age limit. Some of our best senators like Bernie Sanders are on the older side. But at the same time, if you're a senator, right, you have to decide if you're going to run for another six years, and you're already in your 80s, like maybe it is time to just, um, you know, look at some statistics and to think about it. Um, and I do think that some of what's happened around Senator Feinstein is maybe um, influencing her colleagues, because we have had two older male senators, uh, Ben Cardin and um, Tom Carper, announce that they're not going to be running for re-election just within the last few weeks. That's really interesting, Lynette. I'm, I'm so glad you bring that up. One thing I want to touch on is the larger argument that you you talked about that we have been seeing from some politicians, especially like you know those like Nancy Pelosi talking about the ageism and sexism which I think is true and exists. But one thing that really frustrates me about this argument is that like, it's not like, you know, this ageism and sexism, it's not like keeping an 89 year old female senator is going to solve ageism and sexism. That does nothing for the 70 year old who can't retire. That does nothing for the women who are being discriminated in their workplaces. Having old senators who aren't even able to vote on things that could help these women is not doing anything to further those, those issues. And so I kind of hate that argument in that term, in the terms of like, you know, keeping one old white lady, no offense, in the Senate does not actually solve issues for women across the country um, at all. And in fact, it can make it worse because she's not even able to vote on things that we need to get passed. So it's really frustrating. But and I'm and my thought is too, like, this is a job where you represent so much more than yourself. Yet so often we see people on both sides, we see the Feinsteins, and then we also see the McConnells who are quite literally gripping on to the last vestiges of power with if you've ever seen pictures of his hands, which I'm gonna see if our producer Brad will allow me to superimpose a gross picture of McConnell's wrinkly blackened hands Jump with scare. age. Yeah, like will not let go of the vestiges of power for very specific reasons. And it's just really frustrating to me because I don't think that the argument that we should have old senators and old people running for president is the same as saying as the ageism that exists within our society. Because I think they're very two two very different things. But Rhett, what are your thoughts? Yeah, so Senator Feinstein is one of my senators here in California. And, you know, as California is the largest state by population, it's kind of, you know, in this Senate where every state gets two senators, thinking that California is like effectively only had one senator these past few months, kind of serving the interests of all the people of California, like is a little upsetting. We are the biggest state. Yeah, we only have one senator um, for the past few months. And of course, like Senator Feinstein was like holding up some of these key votes, as you mentioned, like on the Judiciary Committee. And we just really, I think you have this need for proper representation in our government. And, you know, anybody that like, I think that the argument is more like being in the United States Congress, being in the House of Representatives or the Senate, it is a grueling job. Of course, we talked about the lavish spending and the corruption and all of that, but like when it gets down to like the everyday logistics of those jobs, like these people are like flying back and forth from their district, their state to the Capitol every week. Right. And they're spending hours every day in the Capitol building. This is a very, very intense and grueling job that does require people to be kind of on it. And I think that when people cannot be on it for any reason, I think that's when it looks like, okay, like, are you effectively serving the people? And that can look like a variety of different things for sure. 
Um, and I think it's important that we, we are very much addressing that this is like not an argument that should ever come from like ableism or anything like that, but it's just about being an effective leader. And that can look like anything. And I just, I appreciate the nuance that we have within this conversation too, of like, it's not sexism, it's not ableism. It's important to call those things out when we see it for sure, but it's about proper representation. Yeah, absolutely. And just one thing that I wanted to add is that we shouldn't lose sight of the role that Republicans are playing in all of this. So while Feinstein was out, there was an effort to replace her on the Judiciary Committee so that it could get back to its job of confirming judges. And the Republicans refused to do it. And there's even some question if Feinstein were to resign and California Governor Newsom were to appoint a replacement of if Republicans would even refuse to seat that person on the Judiciary Committee or another Democrat. And this just goes to show how much Republicans will weaponize Senate procedure, will use every tool in their toolbox to stop Democrats and President Biden from doing the job that the American people elected them to do. And I just wanted to be sure to mention that because I feel like it's easy to just see the things that Republicans are doing and think, well, of course, that's just how they are. Of course, they're going to do that. But no, it is not normal to weaponize the illness of an elderly woman um, in that way. And we shouldn't forget that. And then my other thought was just that how we got into that situation with Feinstein and then what's going on with cinema. I do think that they're linked because they're both just about people who are not willing to give up power. That cinema, you know, she's someone who would probably be a happier person if she quit to become a high paid lobbyist focused on her hobbies and not have to do a job that she clearly doesn't like but she just doesn't seem to want to give up the power and attention. And I feel like that's what's been going on with Feinstein, Chuck Grassley, and a lot of these other senators who won't retire as well. Yeah, I definitely agree, Linda. I think that sums it up perfectly. I think, you know, we're in a system that is supposed to be comprised of checks and balances. And I would love to see a couple more of those checks balancing some things out right now, because I think we've got a lot of people who are not necessarily doing what is in the best interest of the people who um, elected them. So it's pretty disappointing. But that said, we will continue to watch the Senate. We will keep you updated on Diane Feinstein. We will continue to let you know what the heck Chris and Cinema is doing as we get closer to 2024 and beyond. But I think for today, that's all we've got. So thank you for joining us again at Progress America Unfiltered, and we will see you next time. Bye. 